So the drumming on the chairs might be a little irritating to you, but that's a joyful noise to God, right? So we're going to remember that and allow the children to celebrate God. And, and listen, we want them to be stiff like us. But God said we need to become like little children, right? So that's very important to remember that we become as little children and uh, have that freedom. So uh, another announcement that was not made was on Thursday nights, the church uh, goes to the square, and that's the compel ministry, okay? Can you say compel? Yeah. So this isn't something that we made up. The word says that we should go into the hedges and the highways and compel them to come. So uh, starting this year, the Lord moved us to the square. Years prior, we did it right in this neighborhood. We worked this ground. But in any discipleship uh, movement, it, it should grow outward, right? So we still love this neighborhood, but we worked and tilled this ground for years, and God is saying, go to the heart of the city now. So did we hear right? I think we did, because in order to move, we needed something to move all our equipment with, right? And then God blessed us with a trailer, didn't he? Free of charge. Let's give God praise for that. Then... If we're going to be outside, we need to project our voices, and we need lights, and we need amplifiers, and we need all these things, and God bless us with all that stuff free of charge. Let's give God praise for that. <laughs> then, even though I say, hey, church, hey, whole church, let's go, sometimes everybody doesn't come, all right? So if I'm being obedient and if I'm in the will of God, there will be fruit there. Something will happen. So, what has happened is we're up to 11 churches. 11 churches meet us down there in the square. Representatives from 11 churches come down there. And just when I thought maybe we wouldn't have enough, God says, leave it to me, all right? And that's what the body of Christ is. Pieces and pieces over here and over there. And we all come together to do a great work for God. To the point where... I canceled Wednesday night, uh, or Wednesday night compel and moved it to Thursday night. And the reason I did that was so that more churches could be involved. I just got a call or a text from a pastor this morning that said he told his church that they're moving their thing from Wednesday night to Thursday night so that they can be with us downtown in the square. <laughs> compel them to come. I believe we have a few people that we met out uh, while we were walking. Is it just you two? Can you raise your hands? So as we were out walking, we met them, and they came. Anyone else hear from us seeing them in the neighborhood? So praise God. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning. Uh, they would not be here if we did not go. Think about your family members that you want to be saved. Unless someone goes, because you've been trying. They don't listen to you because your uncle, dad, whoever... But unless someone obeys the call to go, who then can be saved if they don't hear the message of the gospel? So I'm so excited to have them here. I'm excited to see what God's going to do in the square this Thursday at 630. But we need help in going. Um, we, we try to meet at the church. Jim, uh, where'd he go? Right there. All right. That camouflage shirt, I guess. Um, what time do we need to be here this Thursday? Because we're doing the audio equipment as well. Be here at 5. All right, be here at 5. So those who the Holy Spirit moves to go or to come, please be at the church at 5 to help load, and then we'll start at 6.30 in the square. All right. Praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Let's get ready to eat spiritual food. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you for the opportunity to feed your sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my lambs. So God, I love you. And your greatest call to me for these people that you died for is to feed them. 
So the hour has come for me to feed them, God. And may I only give them what you have prepared. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that their spiritual hunger, God, would be open and satisfied in this moment. For your word says those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. I ask for an anointing to be upon your servant, God, that I might deliver your truth with the power, God, that it has. Move my ideas away from this message. Move my mind away from this sermon. May I have the mind of Christ. May I be just your humble servant willing to feed those you love so that they might not faint in the wilderness. I pray, God, that they would have ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. So this should conclude our series called Go, the Pathway to Purpose. As I introduced to you seven messages to go, God has given us a new strategy for this church that if you have been called to partner here, we're not doing membership, okay, but partnership. So if God has called you to partner with this church, there is a process in which we would uh, we are going to uh, enact to create and uh, allow you to grow to that point that God wants you to grow. So a church is really a disciple making factory. That's what you should be here for, to learn how to be a follower of Jesus Christ so that you might teach others to follow him as well. Because if the message doesn't continue, then the numbers of the church begin to dwindle and God needs a worldwide church. God needs a marketplace church, a neighborhood church. Everywhere we go, we are the church. So I'm not trying to build the numbers of this building. I'm trying to build the bricks of this building. See, you are living stones. The Bible calls you living stones. You are what makes up his church. And we are, we are built on the rock, which is Jesus Christ. So there are seven steps on the pathway to purpose. There's salvation, baptism, partnership, Life and rest training or classes, discipleship, where you will be discipled by someone, spiritual gifts and service, where you'll learn what your spiritual gifts are so that you might serve, and then finally, learning how to disciple others. Church, can you say this with me? I am a disciple maker. Yes, you are. You see, we've got to make Christianity stop being just about us. And make it be about others as well, okay? You are disciple makers. You've got a call on your life to be like Pastor Jim said, an ambassador for Jesus Christ. That is so very important. So pretty soon here we're going to be uh, putting together the program to see where you are in this pathway of purpose. Because my desire is this. Uh, as they begin coming from Compel. Not just to our church, but 11 other churches are going to start getting new people. Why? Because we're the ones out there fishing, right? The fish come to the fishermen. As they come in, we want to be able, my, my desire is for, the, for each of you to be in a place, if this is your church, that I can walk a brand new Christian up to you and say, please disciple them. If that scares you, if that worries you, then good. It just means you have an opportunity to learn more. You should get excited about, okay, all right, that's my goal. Church, can you say this with me? That's my goal. That's my goal. Come on now. How long have you been serving Jesus, right? It's, 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 it's time that someone be able to hand someone over to you and say, please disciple this person. What scares us is this sometimes. If I disciple them, they're going to act like me. They're going to be like me. And I don't always have it together. But won't you teach them that? Won't you teach them about the mercy of God? Won't you teach them that sometimes you stumble and sometimes we need to repent? So it's not perfection that God is looking for when it comes to you being disciple makers. It's obedience. Will you be obedient to make more disciples? All right. Let's go to Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. The father's business is a must. My grandest desire right now is to take church from a place that is 
uh, grown to be internal and make it external again. Can you imagine if the original disciples only went to the synagogue only and never spread the gospel? How far behind the world would be if the gospel was still in Jerusalem only? But they went out. They went abroad. They were obedient to God to go to make disciples of all nations. So my desire for you is to see that Sunday morning is not the only sacred day to God. Every day is sacred and holy to God. Every day should be for our service to God. Every day we should worship the Lord. Oh, please don't just pour out your worship to him on Sunday because he's good all every day. Every single one of you have survived every attack on your life thus far because you're here in this building right now. And so that means that on Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays that God is worthy of praise every single day. For the word of God says, this is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm asking God with the force of all heaven to pull all of us out of religious mindsets because it's religion that makes you clean yourself up on a Sunday, but then live like the world every other day of the week. That's a religious thing. And that means that we are not truly his sons and daughters. We're just people going through religious motions. My heart's desire is that we would be like Jesus. I'm looking for Christians to be Christ-like again. I'm looking for the heart of God to live in each and every one of us and to remember that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. So if Christ lives in us, then why aren't we seeking? Because we have adopted this miserable gospel that, that is so me-centered. So I, it's just about me alone. No, it's not. He saved you for a purpose that you might lead others to him as well. It's time to take your pastor off the stage and, and stop saying that your job is just to invite people to this building so that your pastor can preach at them. I'm trying to let you know that you are ambassadors for Jesus Christ as well. That you can get someone saved, right? You can minister the gospel to them. You can allow them to be baptized. You can do all those things that I would do for them here. And that's how the world changes. Please repent. All of us need to repent for our me-centered Christianity where it's only about us, where we can even know that we've got uncles and aunts and cousins and neighbors who have not heard the gospel. We know that they're not saved, but yet we're silent. What is that? That's a me-centered gospel. That's I'm okay and I'm saved and I have love for me and for my family, but my neighbor next door that I say, oh man, it's so dry out here. The, the lawn sure could use some water. Come on. That's the best you got to say to this neighbor? Well, I don't want to offend them. Offend them! Offend them away from hell. Offend them away from being lost because what you're really doing is showing them the love of God. Because I would hate to be face to face with someone in judgment line. And I'm going up and they're going down. And they, you know what they're going to say to you? Man, why didn't you say something? Why didn't you tell me? Well, I was afraid that you would reject it. I, was, I, didn't, I didn't know what to say. Come on. So the church's job is to get the spirit of fear out of you, to get power and love and a sound mind in you so that you would allow Jesus Christ to fully control this body and mouth and that many would be saved through your life. Your light inside is the gospel message. Your light inside is Jesus. So we must be about our Father's business. Say this with me. I must be about my Father's business. Listen to me. Coming to church and dressing up is not just your Father's business, right? If, if this is the height 
of our, our week with God coming to this building and singing songs and hearing a message, then we are not about our Father's business. And if this is convicting you, I hope it's convicting you with a capital C and an exclamation point on the end, right? Because all of us need to be convicted out of our comfortable lives and say that Jesus Christ, if he lives in me, then I should have his heart. And what's his heart look like? Dying on a cross, looking at those who put him there, and saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Can all of you put your hand on your heart for me for a moment? I want to pray this prayer over us. Father, in order to call you Abba, it means that you are truly our God, our Father. And my prayer this morning, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, is for a heart transplant. God, you know that you blessed me with a new kidney from my brother. If I didn't have that new kidney in my body right now, I would be dead. But Lord, you saw fit that you prepared another kidney for me so that I might continue to live now 10 years since the transplant. Well, Father, we've got a brother, a spiritual brother, the first risen from the dead, and his name is Jesus Christ, and he has come to give us as each a heart transplant. For your word said that you would take away our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh, God. Would you give us the heart of Jesus? It takes a small heart to say, I want to be saved. It takes a large heart to say, I want to see them all saved. I pray for a heart transplant to occur in this place, God. Sometimes we love ourselves to a fault too much. But Lord, help us to love others in the way that we love ourselves. We don't want to be lost. So give us a love to let everyone know the good news about the salvation that we ourselves have. In Jesus' name, church, can you say amen? We need a new heart. We're in Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. It says this, talking about Jesus. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. You see what was going on there in the temple? They were being taught, just like you're being taught right now. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to him, them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then, church, can you say then? then? Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So we are in the part of the series right now. This message is titled, The Path Go, The Pathway to Purpose, Discipling Others. So what I'm going to be teaching you, what the Holy Spirit is going to be teaching you today is how to prepare ourselves to be disciple makers. So we see Jesus at the age of 13 in the temple, listening, teaching, and astounding all those who were around him. So we're going to follow the first disciple maker, which is Jesus Christ see how he lived, see what he did, and copy it. So listen to this. Um, when you hear a message, it's not just for your hearing only, it's for your doing. I'm going to pause, let that sink in. I'm going to turn on the crock pot of your mind so that this can simmer and cook for a while. Listen to me. When you hear a message from God, it is not just for your hearing, it's for your doing. So do you plan on doing what you're hearing right now? 
Because the Bible says, be not hearers of the word only, but be doers as well. So listen to this message as I begin to take through the power of the Holy Spirit, those of you that desire, because that's one thing, that's one thing I got to stop beating myself up about. Because sometimes I struggle as a pastor. Sometimes I get very frustrated with people, right? And God had to bring some correction to me. So the first thing I said this morning was, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. So I had to realign myself and say, my only job to you is to feed you. I can't make you do anything. I can't give you an appetite. I can't convince you to do things because if I'm not careful, it can turn to abuse. If I'm not careful, it can, it can turn to manipulation. Even though it's a good thing to obey God, there still must be a willingness. So all I can do is tell you the truth, right? And then it's, it's up to you whether or not you receive it, whether you eat it, and whether you grow from it. So the first thing I want you to hear this morning on the way to becoming a disciple maker is Jesus, the disciple maker at age 13. Let's look at one of the first things we hear him do at this age. And remember this, that before God uses us to lead others to him, we must first be subject to submitted and surrendered to his will. In verse 51, it says, then he went down with them, meaning his parents, and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. Church, say this with me. He was subject, submitted, surrendered to his parents. Okay, so that's the first disciple maker. He was subject to them. So before we can make disciples, we've got to be subject and submitted and surrendered to our Heavenly Father. And what that means is living in obedience to and in recognition of his authority over our lives. So the question we must ask ourselves is this. Is God an authority figure in your life? Or is he over to the side like a genie in a bottle and you only come to him when you need something? So who is this God of yours? Which gospel have you believed? Who is God to you? Is he the supreme authority figure in your life? Is he Lord? Meaning, see, see, my dad was a little, a, a lowercase l Lord to me. What's that mean? Boy, come here. Boy, take out that trash. Boy, cut the grass. That's, the, that's what a Lord and a subject looks like, right? I, I can't say, I, I could say, I don't feel like cutting the grass. <laughs> what day is it? I don't know what day it is, but the grass is still not cut, so I, it's on me. What is your relationship like with this God? Like, is he just someone that you kind of have a casual relationship with? Or is he Lord? So in order to be a disciple maker, in order to be a disciple maker, you have to be a disciple first. And a disciple is a follower of Jesus Christ where he is Lord over our lives. So listen to this. This is good. I hope you're taking notes. If not, they're on the app. Listen to this. There's supernatural power in being subject, submitted, and surrendered to the will of God. There is a supernatural power that comes with surrendering your life to God. Listen, when you become a Christian, demons are after you. You've got a mark on you. They want, to, they want you back because you served them well. You were a slave to sin. But now that you've turned, you've died to sin, now you're a slave to God and they want you back, right? But no, not so. So we're going to need some power if I'm going to leave the enemy and come to God. I'm going to need some power. So there is supernatural power available to every believer who submits their life to God. And that's found in James chapter 4, verse 7. And it says this, Therefore, submit to God, 
Resist the devil and what? He will flee from you. So a casual Christian cannot say that. What's a casual Christian? Well, I'm in today, out tomorrow. Uh, I praise God on Sunday, but I'm rocking out and getting high and drinking and cussing and living like I want to live every other day of the week. You have no power over the enemy. You can't have power over one and who you still play with. You can't have power over one that you still eat at the same table with. In order to have power over the enemy, you've got to sub subject yourself to God, submit yourself to God, surrender to God, and then you will have the power to resist. Say this with me. I have the power to resist the devil because I am submitted to God. See, the devil is trespassing. So, so when you're submitted to God and the devil comes over on your property, affecting your body, your finances, your family, you've got a right to say, no, no, no. I am subject and surrendered to the Lord my God, Jehovah. You've got no business trying to make me sick or wreak havoc in my life. Satan, I resist you in the name of Jesus Christ. And what has to happen? He must flee. The problem is you can't be over here living in sin and having fun and then getting mad when the devil starts attacking you. Attacking you. First, he's tickling you, right, because you're, you're enjoying all the pleasure of lust. But then those tickles start turning into abuse and bondage. They always do. And then you want to rise up and say, in Jesus' name, get away from me, and he does nothing. Paul, I know. Who Jesus, I know. Who are you? So in order to have power over the enemy, you've got to be completely surrendered and subject to God. Amen? All right. So as Jesus was subjected to his parents, he increased in three key areas. Church say increase. So listen, I told you there was supernatural power in submission to God. So number one, we have power against the enemy, disciple makers, right? So as the devil is wreaking havoc and those that you come and encounter with, you can pray for them and the power of God will come over them and the enemy will be resisted and flee in their lives. But here's some more supernatural things that occur. We see three things that happened to Jesus once he submitted himself to his parents. It says that... Jesus increased, say increase. increase. He increased in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and man. Hallelujah. So when you live a life that is subjected to God, you will have favor with God and man, right? It'll be God's doing, right? So listen, I'm not perfect, but I am subjected, right? So when I need something from my father, my Abba, I can say, Father, I need this, and he will, I have favor with God. I thank God for favor with God. Favor with God comes from living a surrendered life. And not only will you have favor with God, you'll have favor with men. I'll tell you how we got this DJ equipment. I put it online. I said, be praying for the church where God is sending us to go. And then there was a man uh, named Brian Jenkins who was on Facebook that morning. And he was about to post these speakers, this DJ equipment for $5,000. He's going to post it online again. But he came across that post. And the Holy Spirit moved upon him and said, I want you to give it all to Damien, give it all to the church. Why? Because when you are surrendered and subjected to God, you will have favor with both God and man. And listen to me, this is not pastoral favor. This is not African-American favor. This is simply child of God favor because God is not, he's not a uh, respecter of any person. Get you some of this favor. And the way that you get it is by living a surrendered life to God. I'm not perfect, but I'm surrendered. I'm not perfect, but I'm saved. And it's the blood of Jesus that has saved me. And it's this Holy Spirit that has filled me. And if we are his, he will move heaven, he will move earth, he will move the enemy to come see about his. Do you see this favor, all right? So he increased in favor 
and wisdom and in stature. So when you submit to God, when you finally surrender, you see, I was raised in this building, in this church, but I didn't surrender to God till years later. I was living crazy, reckless, right? But one day I said, I'm tired. I'm tired because sin, the way of a transgressor, is hard. A sinful life will beat you down. You'll look older than you should, move slower than you should, be poorer than you should. And you have to surrender and say, okay, God, I, I give up. And as soon as I did that, favor came. He said, move to Lima. Go help your dad at the church. I get to the church. My bride is here going to this church. I get to this church. A man that works at the sheriff's office got me a connection to get hired there. Why? Hallelujah. Because the closer you get to God, favor starts swirling all around you. He starts causing things to move on your behalf because he's got a plan for you. He's got a purpose for your life. But you must be subjected to his will alone. So Jesus grew in wisdom. What is wisdom? It is the knowing and applying of God's ways. You see, that's why we can't just be hearers of the word, but doers as well. Okay, so God, Jesus grew in wisdom. He grew in stature. What does that mean? He grew physically and spiritually mature. He became more mature. And then finally, in favor, he gained the approval and delight of others to the point that their grace and kindness was extended towards him. See, this is what happens, church, when you grow in favor and, and what favor is. Favor is this, giving the best of yourself to others and receiving their best in return. Having favor, amen? Why am I sweating so hard? Have I been yelling at y'all again? Okay, I'm sorry. Let me calm down. All right. The next step is we must become, as disciple makers, as we go to disciple others, we must become empowered for our purpose. Let's go to Luke chapter 3, verses 21 through 23. Jesus was empowered for his purpose. One day when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. As he was praying, church, can you say this with me? As he, As he was praying, it said the heavens open. Wow. I know there's a lot before that verse and after that verse, but let's just get a revelation right now that as we pray, the heavens open. Get that revelation. You're saying, well, where are the blessings and how come things aren't changing in my life? How come it feels like I'm in a drought? How come the heavens aren't open for me? As he prayed, the heavens open, right? Let's keep going. And the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son and, church, can you say and? That and is big. And you bring me great joy. Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his public ministry. So as Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man, it brought his father great joy. So God loves us just because he loves us, right? Because God is love. But this says... He loved Jesus, and Jesus brought him great joy. So church, don't you want God to get great joy from your life? Yes. I'll give you another chance, those of you that were thinking about food and missed the opportunity to get blessed, okay? Don't you want God to get great joy from your life? Yes. Then grow. At 13 years old, all the way up to 30, God announces over him at his baptism, number one, this is my son who I love very much. Okay, God, you love everybody. All right, I get that. But it said, and, and he gives me great joy. That's, I want to be in that category too. I, I, everybody's in the loved category, but I want to upgrade to bring God great joy, that category as well. So how do we do that? From the age of 13 to 30, 
Jesus grew in wisdom. So what does that mean? He applied himself to the teaching. He studied, right? He was not playing marbles. I don't know what they had 2,000 years ago. I don't know what they played, right? He was studying. He was in there learning from scholars. He was maturing both physically and spiritually, right? He put childish things aside. Like like Paul said, when I was a boy, I spoke as a boy, but now I'm a man, right? I put childish things behind. Sometimes men, we fall into the category of still being childish, still like to play childish games, still like to have those youthful lusts burning inside of us, but not Jesus not the son of God. He put that child and stuff behind him and he grew in stature and he grew in, in maturity both physically and spiritually. And then finally, we know that Jesus grew f- lastly in favor with God and man. Are you doing that? Focus on those three things. Some of us are done growing this way. There's other ways we can grow, but Lord, help us. Grow in wisdom. So that means we got to put Facebook down, right? Turn the TV off. You want to be in the joy category or not? You want to bring God great joy or not? Then study. Get in the word of God and study and grow in wisdom, right? And then grow in favor with both God and man. Well, how do I do that? I give people my best. So even when I was in school, at, at Shawnee, right, I was nice to the nerds. I was nice to the punk rockers. I was nice to the skateboarders. I was nice to the preppy ones. I was nice to the athletes, right? I was nice to everybody. And you know what I had? Favor with who? Everybody. That's how you grow in favor with people. You treat everybody right. You don't have favorites, right? You show that your love is for everyone. And that's how you grow in favor with people. And then how do you grow in favor with God? Be obedient. Love him. Serve him. Live to please him. And then you'll grow in favor with God as well. All right. So as Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and favor, he brought his father great joy. And then after receiving the Holy Spirit, he was launched into disciple making. Let's go to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. So in order to be a disciple maker, you need the Holy Spirit on board. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is Jesus telling the disciples. And you will be my witnesses. What are you going to do? Telling people about me everywhere. Here's what it did not say. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be able to go to the synagogue and praise me with great joy. Or you'll be able to go to the synagogue and listen to messages and then go home. No, the Holy Spirit comes so that we can be witnesses. Church, can you say witnesses? Witnesses. Maybe the reason some of you are afraid of public ministry and going out is because the enemy has allowed you to become full of yourself. And when you're full of yourself in that area, you're full of fear. You feel so intimidated, so small, so afraid. But what you have to do is say, Holy Spirit, you came to make me a witness You came to give me this power to be a witness. And then Jesus was launched in the ministry after that. So listen to this. Disciple makers are full of and led by the Holy Spirit. Luke 4.1 says this. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. How much Holy Spirit? Full of. This is after his baptism. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River, and he was led by who? The Spirit in the wilderness. So listen to this. Disciple makers are both full of the Holy Spirit and led by the Holy Spirit. It's not something that you do on your own. Ha ha! You see, religion, you can do on your own. But what God is calling you to do, you need to be empowered with his Spirit to do it. So let that be your greatest prayer. Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can go and do what you're calling me to do. Romans 8, 12 through 14 says this. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. 
For if you live by its dictates or rulership, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. So do you know how to overcome temptation? By the power of the Holy Spirit. So when temptation is coming upon you or against you, you call on the power of the Holy Spirit to knock it down. Verse 14. Here's the DNA test. So if we were to go to Maury Povich, right? And Maury Povich has this yellow envelope, right? A paternity test, right? To find out who our father is, okay? And if we say, I know God's my father, right? You don't have to open it, Maury. I know who my daddy is, right? And then Maury opens the letter and it says... Not the father. You say, what? But I ask Jesus into my heart, but I go to church on Sunday, but I give offerings and I try to be the best I can. Not the father. Well, then who is? Who are his children? Who passes the spiritual DNA test of being the children of God? Listen to what it says here. Romans 8, 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are who? Children of God. That's the DNA test. Not who you say your daddy is, but who you are led by. If you're still led by the flesh and doing all these lustful things, Jesus told him, you act like your father, the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. So every soul on earth has a father, and that father is either the devil, right, or God. So who are the devil's children? Those who are led by their sinful nature. Those who follow after the lust of their flesh belong to the devil. Well, who are God's children? Those who follow his commandments. Those who are led by his spirit. So... Here I am as a man. This old father still calls out to me sometimes. Ooh, boy, would you look at her. And then the heavenly father, the spirit of God, calls out to me too and says, boy, you better not. You know what I'm going to do? Not. Why? Because I'm his child. Whoever you are obeying, that's your daddy, right? So that's that's the spiritual DNA test. All of us can say we belong to God but we are identified as his children by the spirit in which we are led in. Now, I'm not saying sometimes you won't fall down. Sometimes you won't make a mistake, right? Do kids make mistakes sometimes? Do they still have your last name? Sure do, right? My dad used to tell me, boy, don't you be out in them streets messing up my name. You know what that meant? That he had favor in this city. He had favor in this city with both God and man. And he didn't want my name showing up in the newspaper with the DUI at the age 20. But it happened. You know why? Because I'm not perfect, but I'm forgiven. And God can still use me. So even with a criminal record, God can still use you. Don't you dare think that the mistakes that you have made exclude you from being a child of God. Because the only way that we become a child of God is by saying, Jesus, I receive you as my Savior and Lord. And we are adopted into that family. Amen? Amen. All right. This is going to be a part two uh, sermon, uh, but I want to finish up with this last part here. Um, I want to tell you this, that just as Jesus was submitted to the will of Joseph and Mary as their child, so it is with God as his true children. So what is then the mission? What's our mission as disciple makers? The same mission that Jesus had. Jesus went around preaching this message. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17 says this. From then on, Jesus began to preach. What did he do? What did Jesus do? What did Christ do? What should Christians do? What he did, right? Okay. From then on, Jesus began to preach. And listen, you might say, well, I don't know what to tell people. 
Tell them what Jesus told them. Well, I can't do that. I'll hurt their feelings. You know what I got to say if I was going to hell and you hurt my feelings and I see you in heaven? Thanks for hurting my feelings. Thank you for hurting my feelings. Thank you for telling me the truth. That's why, that's why uh, we can't always be respected because we don't always just tell people the truth. We want to dance around issues so that we can be politically correct with people. All right? Tell people the truth in love. And here's what Jesus began to preach. And, and we know that Jesus loved more than anyone. Jesus had agape love, right? Did Jesus love people? Everybody, right? So this is God, and we, we want to make sure that we're holy. So if we're doing something, the Bible says be imitators of God. So if we preach the same message to him that he preached, then it's not being mean. It's not being judgmental. It's the same message Jesus preached. And here's what he said. Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. What's so hard about that? Let's see, I want to see if you can do it. Stand to your feet, please. Those of you who are willing, those of you who you of you who are children of God, those of you that desire to please the Father, would you please repeat this sermon, this very short sermon? That Jesus preached. Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent of your sins, turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Put up one finger. Repent of your sins. Second finger, turn to, God. turn to God. Third finger, for the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven. Is, near. is near. Three pieces. Memorize it in just three pieces. Now, the Holy Spirit might give you that message uh, and say it in a different way to someone, but the truth of the message must remain. So you don't say to a sinner, oh, God knows your heart. Yeah, it's wicked. That heart is wicked. And you must repent and turn from sin because the kingdom of heaven is near. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would empower us with your Holy Spirit. God, would you please spiritually just turn us upside down and shake us and shake everything out of us that is of no use to you. Everything out of us, God, that does you no good so that we can get to the good salt again. For your word says that we are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its, lost its savor, then what good is it for except to be thrown on the ground like we do in the winter to melt ice and trampled upon with the feet of men. That's some bad salt right there. So Holy Spirit, shake us. Get all the bad salt out of us, God. We don't want to be like the Dead Sea where the salt content is so high that nothing can live there. Father, in the name of Jesus, as you have shaken the bad salt out of us so that the good salt can come back again, flip us back over, God, and we need some new oil. We need an anointing. An anointing that burns like fire, like a city that is set on top of a hill that cannot be hid. We need that light again. God, I believe, for the most part, in the Christian church, there's this artificial light that's burning. The light of self-works, self-righteousness, just good enough, just, 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 just enough to get by. 
But that's not the light that you called us to be. You called us to be not the light to ourselves, but the light of the world. So, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us. Church, you can open your eyes for a moment. And I think this is going to be the next series I preach here. Because I asked God a question about some of you. In my frustration, I told you pastors get frustrated sometimes. I asked him a question about you. I said, God, where are they? Like when we say go, come on, let's go. We're going to do it. We're going to win the city. I said, God, where are they? You know what he told me? He said, they're broken. There's some issues that are alive in some of us that prevent us from moving forward when he says go. So now, pray for me as I endeavor to hear from God and present the truth to you that will set you free. Because some of your brokenness in here, especially if you've been a Christian for a long time and you can't go, some of it came from church hurt. There's some deep wounds. Jesus. There's some deep wounds that Jesus didn't cause that affected some of you in churches. And you change churches, but the wound is still there. You change churches, but you're still limping. You're still hurting. And you might say, no, no, I'm over it. I'm over it. But when it's time to go and you're not there or you don't feel equipped, if you're honest with yourself, here's what's going to happen, church. And don't don't miss these next series coming up. It's going to be hard to listen to. It's going to be hard to deal with. There's going to be some things exposed in us, but God wants to set us free from some things that have broken our lives. Some of you, it, it was divorce. Some of you, it was your children. Your children have broken you, and you can't go. There's just, there's just these reasons, these issues, right? These issues that cause the body of Christ to not be able to run like they ought to. But will you believe me for a moment? Because there was a woman in the Bible that had an issue of blood. And she did not say, listen to this revelation. She did not say, if I can just get to church, I know I will be set free. I know I will be healed. She said, no, if I can just get to Jesus and touch the hem of his garment, I know I will be healed. Listen to me. Church is not Jesus. Jesus is the head of the church. Church does not heal you. Church does not help you. It's Jesus alone that saves. It's Jesus alone that heals. So I know that sometimes coming to this building makes you feel good and just feel you feel his presence, but that's not enough. You need Jesus. You need Jesus to touch your brokenness. You need Jesus to fix that issue. Some of you, some of you, you were the child that was least favored by your parent. And you've carried that hurt around for so long. Some of you, before you were saved, you were so deep in sin that even after you got saved, you still carry condemnation from the past. And that doesn't, that doesn't reflect well with Jesus because the word of God says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So you can go to church all you want. And church won't fix your issues. You can change churches. That won't fix it. You must come to Jesus. Hands lifted all over the building. It must be Jesus. Do not elevate church above Jesus. If you were hurt in a church, the church hurt you. That church hurt you. Those people hurt you, not Jesus. 
Jesus never hurts us. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He laid down his life for you. I know they talked about you and maybe the pastor of the church fell over into sin and maybe it just damaged your faith, but that man was not Jesus. That woman was not Jesus. Jesus is still high and lifted up. Jesus is still the spotless lamb of God, the righteous one, the holy one, the sinless one. Jesus is not affected when men fall. Jesus is not affected when churches hurt people. He's still good. Just tell the Lord he's good. Tell the Lord he's good. He's good, he's good, he's good. Oh, he's good, he's good, he's good. His mercy endureth forever. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we praise you, Lord. You are good, you are good, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Don't charge Jesus in the offenses in which men have done to you. Because as we learned a, bit, a little bit ago, Satan can move people too. Healing, Lord. Healing, Lord. Oh, Jesus. Heal us, Lord. Heal our brokenness, Lord. Heal us, Lord Jesus. Some of you were touched inappropriately when you were young, and that started your life in a spiral of promiscuity. You learned about those things way too early, and it caused you to be tripped up in spiral and promiscuity and lust because that was the assignment of the enemy to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I wanna have, I got some good news for you today. You don't have to live in that shame anymore. Jesus has come to give you life and life more abundantly. It's time, it's time, it's time to reject the package that the enemy tried to destroy you with and accept the gift of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses all of our sin. And listen to what else the blood does. The blood of Jesus Christ also cleanses the sins that were committed against our bodies. The whole Oh, hallelujah. The blood of Jesus Christ also cleanses the sins that were spoken against us. The hurt that was caused to you, the shame, the rejection, he washes all sin. Oh, I wish I could get somebody to believe me this morning that Jesus washes away all sin. Not just your sin that you committed with your body, but the sins of others that were committed against you. And do you know what can happen after that? You can forgive them. You can forgive those that hurt you. You can forgive those that, that neglected you, that used you and misused you. Why? Because you have freedom now. You are free from what they did to you. Some of you are broken simply because you don't understand that his ways are higher than your ways and his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So some of you, some of you are broken because you don't understand something God did. Oh, how you wish he would not have done it that way. God, why did I have to lose my job or lose my house? Lord, why did my child have to die? I don't understand if you're so good, then why did you take them? The reason you're broken is because your mind does not have the capacity to think like God. To know like God. Your mind does not have the capacity to understand the ways of God. 
If God is good, then that means he's good all the time. Even when it hurts. Even when it hurts. So stop trying to understand what God did and just say, God, I want peace. Because the word says that God will give us peace that surpasses understanding. So it means that when the distance between what God did and what we understand is immeasurable and we'll never get it and we claim to be broken from it, he'll make up the distance in our understandings, his, his brain with our brain, that distance will be covered all in between with shalom. Just peace. So you got to get to the point where you say, God, I don't, I don't want to understand anymore. This hurts my brain. It hurts my life. This breaks me. God, I don't need to understand anymore. There's something greater. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Will you trade your pain for peace? That's what he's offering you today. I will give you peace. Not like the world gives. Trade your brokenness for peace. Just do it now. Come on, do it now. Do it now. Say, God, I don't want to hurt anymore. I just want peace. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, 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 shalom. Shalom, 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 shalom. Peace be still. Let him speak to your brokenness right now and tell it to be still. Peace be still. Okay, to wrap this up now. Where does the final freedom come in brokenness? The final freedom comes in truth. They shall know the truth and the truth shall do what? Make them free. So the greatest hurt of my life was when my father died. And that thing hurt me bad. But what's the truth? The truth is that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's the truth. And I can rejoice in the truth. I'll buy that. I'll take the truth. So what you got to learn about your brokenness is this. The, th the thing that feeds our brokenness is usually our mind has not accepted his truth. We're still trying to fight for our truth. Still trying to fight for our right, what we wanted where we have to just surrender that thing and let it go. Will you put your hands out in front of me this morning with those issues? Those things that broke you. I know you're saved. I know you're Holy Ghost filled. But sometimes we got some brokenness. Sometimes we got some issues. So put them out in front of you right now. Put them out in front of you. Say this with me, Holy Spirit, I surrender my brokenness, my shortcomings, and my sin to you. Holy Spirit, I surrender my need to know. And in exchange, I receive both peace and truth 
In Jesus' name, amen.